Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, September 5th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and I'm recording from Amsterdam, Netherlands. NetLab 360 has an interesting blog post with some recent attacks against Microtech routers. These attacks take advantage of a vulnerability that Microtech originally patched, I believe, in April, but a CVE, and that would be CVE 2018-14847, wasn't assigned until early August. Now, after the vulnerability was patched by Microtech, lots of details about it became known. The vulnerability can be used to read arbitrary files, including username and password databases, and then that information can be used to essentially reconfigure or even in some cases execute code on the router. As typical for this type of vulnerability, of course, crypto coin miners were all over it. It was also used to inject coin hive miners into traffic that is proxied by Microtech routers, even though there was some discussion whether or not that actually worked. But what NetLab360 figured out is there is another class of attacks that these routers are being used for, and they discovered 5,000 plus routers affected by these attacks. There are really two things that these attacks do. Now, first of all, Microtech has a feature that allows you to redirect traffic being passed through the router to a third party. And this can be used to eavesdrop on traffic passing through the router. And this is one configuration change that is being made by some of these attacks. Secondly, some attacks are enabling the SOX proxy on these routers, which then can be used to route traffic through the routers, hiding behind the routers. I've seen this a couple of years ago, even in some more sort of APT style attacks that used router networks like this in order to obfuscate the real origin of the attack. So what does this mean for you if you are running a Microtech router or if you're running into a Microtech router at like a relative's network or such? Well, first of all, make sure you are patched that you have this patch from last April installed or any later patches that may have been released. And after you patch, also make sure that your configuration didn't get changed. Some of these configuration changes, like for example, the SOX proxy, they will survive patching. Well, your configuration will be maintained after your patching. So all these malicious changes, of course, will be maintained as well. And then we have an older issue that made the news again, and that's exposed .git directories. This is by far not a new issue. It actually even predates Git, even Subversion and other version control systems exposed directories that then exposed source code of the site. I always think that it's actually less severe with Git because with Git you only have this one directory and that's the top level directory to worry about. So it's typically actually not too hard to have this above the document root for your particular web server. But if you can't do that, if it has to reside within the document root, then yes, you know, set up some access control rules that block access to this directory. And the blog post here also makes a good suggestion to just block everything that starts with dot. There is really only one directory that you do want to expose that starts with a dot, and that's the dot well known directory. For example, Let's Encrypt or so leaves its challenges there. And and it has become sort of a standard directory that is used more and more to expose configuration information that you would like to communicate to others in standardized formats. And the researcher at RiskIQ has figured out that some web servers that are protected behind Tor can be unmasked via their TLS certificates. RiskIQ crawls the internet for TLS certificates from web servers. And what he noticed was that some of these certificates that were collected by connecting to web servers directly were identical to certificates being presented by web servers that were protected by Tor, which 
of course makes it an obvious conclusion that the two web servers were identical. So if you are running a web server behind Tor and you're counting on Tor to actually protect the identity of that web server, meaning its actual IP address, then you better make sure that you cannot connect to this web server without actually connecting through Tor. One of the conclusions or one of the recommendations here was to actually have the web server only listen on on loopback. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.